So welcome. Uh, tonight we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication on this very date uh, of James Joyce's exuberant kaleidoscopic modernist masterpiece, the novel Ulysses. Um, I am Patrick O'Donnell. I'm the Director of Education here at Celtic Junction Arts Center. Uh, we're here in the McKiernan Library, so Falchiroi to Shak, as Misha Padraig O'Donnell, Stuart Ahori Jakis, Ilarland McKiernan. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm here tonight with my colleague, Lynette, uh, who will be moderating tonight's um, um, conversation about why the novel still matters on its 100th anniversary. Hi, thank you, Patrick. I'm Lynette Rainey Grandel. Uh, I'm a poet. Uh, I'm a memoirist. Um, I'm a student of literature. I'm a college professor at Normandale Community College. Uh, and when I was an undergraduate, I read Joyce's Ulysses for the first time and was blown away by the challenge of it. So I'm very excited to talk with Patrick tonight about this wonderful, amazing book. Uh, Dr. Patrick O'Donnell is a, also a full-time English faculty member at Normandale Community College, and he is the founder of the St. Paul Irish Arts Week uh, and director of education at Celtic Junction Arts Center. Patrick teaches many, many literatures, um, American, British, and Irish Gothic tales, Irish American short stories, Irish literature, literary history, and mythology, and you're going to hear all about some of those subjects tonight. Um, he co-edited the, co the 18 author anthology, The Harp and the Loon, Literary Bridges Between Ireland and Minnesota. And I suppose this is also a good time for me to mention, um, we will be taking um, questions um, at any time. If you have a question, just enter it at the Q, in the Q&A um, area in the bottom of the screen. And um, towards the end, we will start answering them and possibly even in the middle if it seems appropriate to come back to some of them. So I'll be keeping an eye on that for Patrick and um, uh, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Lynette. So why does James Joyce's novel still matter on its 100th anniversary? And so the quote I have is from the first major study by Stuart Gilbert. He collaborated with uh, Joyce, and it's this fantastic line, he says, in the story of a Dublin day, we have an epic of mankind. So James Joyce, born in 1882, he grew up in Dublin, Catholic, lower middle class Dublin. Um, he authored altogether four masterpieces. So his first collection was the short story collection Dubliners, published in 1914. Then his autobiographical meditation on the life of the artist, por a portrait of the artist was published in 1916. And then there was the struggle to get Ulysses published. Uh, he worked on it for seven years in several cities, uh, in Trieste, uh, Zurich, and then Paris, where it was published in 1922. His last masterpiece was Finnegan's Wake, published in, um, again on his birthday in 1939. And then he passed away in Switzerland, where he was buried in the Flunturn Cemetery in 1941. So it was published by Sylvia Beach. Now the story of Joyce and Sylvia Beach is fascinating. So uh, Sylvia Beach was an American expatriate. Um, she was sort of trying to contemplate where to open a bookstore. She thought about London, but the prices were too high. So she um, settled in Paris in 1919 and eventually opened what has now become one of the most famous bookstores, arguably in Europe, which is the Shakespeare and Company. Now, um, she uh, was invited to a dinner party in July 1920 by her girlfriend, Adrienne Monnier, who ran the other bookstore around the corner on the Rue de Lodian. Um, and she was told that at this dinner party would be the great Irish author, James Joyce. So she, even though she didn't want to go, she decided she would go. Um, Joyce had been persuaded to visit Paris. Uh, he, he had been met by the uh, great American catalyst for literary exper experimentation, uh, Ezra Pound, in Italy the previous month in June 1920. And he was, he had, he, had, uh, he, was, he was staying, he thought, for a few weeks in Paris. Ultimately, he would stay there for 20 years. Now, at this dinner party, once people started talking about literature, 
Joyce excused himself and went into a little small library in the apartment where the dinner party was happening. And Sylvia Beach followed him. Uh, she extended her hand to him and said, uh, you are the great uh, Irish writer, James Joyce. Um, and he just put his hand back, little frail hand. He said, no, just James Joyce. So Joyce's humility was manifest. When she explained to him that she had a little bookstore, English language bookstore called Shakespeare and Company, Joyce produced a little notebook and he jotted down, <laughs> as he was always producing his little notebook, he jotted down her, the address. He was fascinated by the name Shakespeare and Company. He was looking for good luck. As you can see in the photograph, he suffered terribly from uh, diseases of the eye and undergo had undergone several eye operations, uh, several dozen actually across his entire lifespan. Um, uh, and so he visited her uh, and in subsequent uh, the subsequent uh, months, a deep friendship uh, emerged. His book had been published in small editions, uh, small episodes. Not the book hadn't been published yet. Episodes from the book had been published in the literary journal called The Little Review in America and had been suppressed in New York um, as containing obscene uh, uh, language. Uh, so he really thought nobody would publish it. So in 1921, in a conversation with Sylvia, he said he just was despairing as to what would happen to his novel. He had 14 episodes written when he arrived in Paris in July 1920, uh, all the way up to The Oxen of the Sun, which is the great depiction of the English language as stages of, an, of a fetus in the womb. Um, an extraordinary piece of writing, um, but he didn't think anybody would publish it. So Sylvia said, sounds funny when you say Sylvia said, Sylvia said that she would publish the book and he immediately agreed. Right, in 1921. Now, she was aware of the epoch making quality of the book. So she wrote to her mother that she was going to publish the most important work of the age. So she, she was very conscious of that. Um, his reputation, she was awestruck by Joyce. Um, and, she, and, and he appreciated the name Shakespeare and Company um, because he saw that as a suitable. Uh, vehicle for his book. Now, she, Sylvia Beach had never published a book before, so this is her first publication. Uh, they, she published a couple of other minor works much later on related to James Joyce, but this is the book. So if you are running a bookstore in Paris and you have probably the greatest uh, literary genius, um, certainly establishing his reputation uh, indisputably with this publication, um, she was quite the canny and insightful person. So, Lynette, what's what are you? What's your thoughts on uh, your own impressions on Ulysses? Sorry. Want, yeah, I just wanted to add um, that that um, the Shakespeare and Company still exists for those who want to make a literary pilgrimage to it. I remember again when I was an undergraduate, not long after I'd read Ulysses, I was in Paris, and um, I think it's in a different location now, right, yes. along the Seine or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. So, you, but you can you can go there. You can get a bookmark. Uh, <laughs> you can be. It's all about, in, going, it's all about going to the museum. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me thank you. That that was great. So let me move on. So the next uh, most important influence in in Joyce's life uh, was Nora Barnacle. Now Nora Barnacle was a uh, young woman from Galway, from Uttarard in Galway, uh, who moved up to to uh, work in Dublin, get away from her oppressive family background. And she met Joyce in the street in Dublin. Uh, she thought he was a Norwegian sailor, is the way he was wearing this this this, this uh, funny kind of striped outfit. Um, and they set up a date and they really began the relationship on June 16th, 1904. And that is the day he sets the novel. So the basic uh, premise of the novel, it's one day, about 18 hours, begins in the morning. There are three characters, the young, brooding, displeased, grumpy, intellectual poet, Stephen Dedalus, uh, who is a version of Joyce as a young man in not, when he was 22 years old. Um, and then the mature uh, father, uh, the Jewish advertising salesman, Leopold Bloom, who is the Odysseus character. Ulysses is the Latinized version of Odysseus. And then Molly Bloom is the wife of Leopold. And those are the three main characters whose lives are interwoven through the 18 episodes of the novel. Okay, so 
Uh, Nora's letters um, contributed to the concluding monologue, Molly Bloom's monologue, known as the Penelope uh, monologue, right? And so Nora, Nora wasn't particularly as impressed as everybody else <laughs> of Joyce's genius, um, partly because uh, Richard Elman, Joyce's biographer, records that across the entire arc of Joyce's life, um, he probably had about 200 different addresses. So this was a guy who was constantly on the move, uh, constantly money troubles. When he had money, he was very extravagant. He'd extravagantly tip waiters. And um, and so it was a somewhat turbulent, but very, very close uh, relationship. And so when she read the Penelope episode, the concluding Molly Bloom episode, she commented, I guess the man's a genius, but what a dirty mind he has, hasn't he? Okay, so what do the critics say about Ulysses? So let me just jump into this. Uh, so T.S. Eliot, uh, T.S. Eliot, the American expatriate who became a, a naturalized British citizen, um, an extraordinarily important uh, poet and critic, uh, sort of a former of the whole cultural landscape of that period. Um, he said that it was the most important expression which the present age has found. It is a book to which we are all indebted and for, from which none of us can escape. And 1922 is the year of modernism uh, because first Ulysses was published in February and then later that year, uh, Eliot publishes The Wasteland. Uh, those are the two milestone works of uh, literary uh, expression. Uh, Carl Jung, the, the brilliant um, psychologist, uh, read it and wrote a long, uh, very insightful article he said, what is so staggering about Ulysses is the fact that behind a thousand veils, nothing lies hidden. And this is partly the reason why it was constantly being censored, that it turns neither toward the mind or toward the world, but as cold as the moon looking on from cosmic space allows the drama of growth, being, and decay to pursue its course. So Jung really saw the book as sort of a total portrait of the psyche and of life in the city. And uh, then the great... Um, Irish critic and professor of literature, Declan Kybert said, before Joyce, no writer of fiction had so foregrounded the process of thinking. And this is really taking us into the reasons why uh, Ulysses matters. Okay, so I'm gonna offer 12 reasons. And um, uh, Lynette, I want you, your views obviously as we proceed. And I'll pause once we kind of cover three, and then I'll pause and review them and perhaps, you know, uh, first one is modernism. So modernism is dated uh, from about 1890 to about 1940. Some people push it up to 1945, but this is the tremendous uprooting, the tremendous modern period in terms of technology, in terms of people moving to cities. It's also the rise of skepticism towards religious uh, pieties. It's the, uh, the whole new rise of psychology, the discovery of the, unco discovery of the unconscious, Women's rights, are on, the, the working class are on the move. This whole uh, transformative, turbulent uprooting of old certainties. And so the best little definition is by Ezra Pound, the great American poet, uh, the shock of the new. And that's when you first start to read Ulysses, you get that sense of something new, something shocking, something innovative that the conventions of the novel have been um, to a certain extent, remade, reconceptualized. Uh, Lynette, Lynette, how, how would you? Yeah, I, I would like to add a little bit to that. So, I mean, modernism, you know, we, you can sort of look at it stylistically in terms of the fragmentation. And then it's always interesting to think about where the fragmentation is coming from. And I think that a lot of it would be attributed to what you were talking about um, with the changes in the social dynamics, um, kind of the spiritual upheavals going on. I mean, remember that Darwin is published, I think, 1861. And so that's been churning for a couple of generations now. Certainly the rise of cities. Um, Victorianism is very popular right now uh, because it looks so good on t in television and movies, right? Um, the whole steampunk thing. But if you look at what is captured vic with Victorianism, you've got this kind of intense, grimy city. You've got the development of that urban underclass. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff going on that modernism is confronting. It's all of that baggage from that. 
Um, and I think that modernism also, it, it's interesting to me because there's an exuberance about it. You know, it's like, yes, we're going to start a new ism this week. And yes, we're going to create new forms. But at the same time, there's this sense that, oh, we thought it was solid before and it's gotten broken. Um, we, there, there, there are wars that are coming up. Um, people are starting to get disenchanted with war. And while um, World War I has happened by the time, you know, 1922 comes along, there was a sense of change before then. Um, Virginia Woolf uh, comments that, um, in her, and, and people think that she was being a little funny with this because it's so precise. She said, on or about 1910, I think she, I didn't write it all down. I think she says December 1910, human nature changed. Um, and so there's this sense that society is moving towards something very new and modernism becomes an expression of this. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. The, the Virginia Woolf quote is very interesting. She didn't like James Joyce. In fact, she called him uh, underbred and said it was like uh, his writing was like the scratchings of uh, it's like an undergraduate scratching his pimples, which actually is quite accurate. Joyce would have probably liked that description. Uh, so the next the next reason is um, the great French poet who was a friend to Joyce and gave let him stay in his apartment called called the work a comic masterpiece. So the French uh, commentators see Joyce as part of a European tradition of fiction, looking back to people like Honoré de Balzac, who wrote, of course, the the human comedy. And so they see that the city the, again the elements of modernism you were re referencing there the kind of sense of there's a newness. There's a, an uprooting and alienation in the city. Um, it's post Nietzsche. You know, Nietzsche stated in 1882 that God is dead, and Nietzsche is referenced in the opening episode of the novel. Thus speaks Zarathustra. So there's a sense in which God is no longer a certainty. Evolution has come along. Uh, new, the new psychology has come along. Women's rights have come along, and there's a sense in which um, everything is in a state of flux, turbulation, but also but also a sense of a vital opportunity that this modern spirit um, is very compelling. So Joyce always said that with, with all of the different critics who responded, some very harshly, some with great hyperbole to his novel, he said that they, they didn't ever say that it was actually a funny book. And so the, the book is, pervade, per, is absolutely permeated with the Irish comic spirit, with a kind of a witty self the Irish comic spirit is very self-deprecating, very self-critical, very self-mocking. Um, and we particularly see that in the third episode when Stephen Dedalus is out in Sandy Mount Strand and he's imagining um, all of his pretensions when he wanted to be a, a young writer. Um, he was going to write books, only uh, the titles of the books would only be letters. So he's imagining, have you read his F? Well, no, I like his W. Well, what about his Q? Well, his, I prefer his W. So he's kind of mocking this whole sense of trying to be an author. And so Joyce is mocking himself in the portrait of Stephen Dedalus. And that sense of humor is one of the ways into this novel, one of the ways to not see it as intimidating. I mean, it, the modernist context is actually what makes it really fascinating rather than intimidating. But the humor, I think, is what really brings people in. But did you find it um, amusing oh. when you first encountered oh. it? Well, well, no, not at first, because remember, I was an undergraduate and I, this was presented as a very difficult book to read. And so I was going to rise to the challenge intellectually. No, I think I think you have to once you're able to move past that, once somebody gives you permission to see the humor, it is hilarious and it's mostly potty humor. Um, you, you, know, you, were, you were talking about the self-deprecating self uh, part of, of it. And, and yeah, in um, Leopold Bloom, I think it's Bloom who he's he's out in the outhouse and you know he's reading this prize winning story or something like that in the newspaper and he kind of wishes he'd been able to write that you know he's he's sort of he's he, he's he's a wannabe writer as well but he only gets as far as advertising and then you know he's done his business and so he rips the page in half and uses it to clean himself up i mean you know i only only an author would be able to write that i think that doesn't sound part, right. of, part of the I... part of the humor of that is that 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 uh, newspaper that he's using uh titbits it's called joyce had actually published something in it so joyce was also 
there's another mocking of Joyce of himself. And uh, that's one of the things that's so, uh, so interesting, the way people elevate Joyce as this great genius. And Joyce is always trying to bring people down to earth. Uh, at one time, um, when he was in a restaurant, a, uh, a kind of a fan came up to him and said, let me shake the hand that wrote Ulysses. And Joyce said, well, I did many other things as well. <laughs> so that kind of bring people down to earth is part of the genius of Ulysses. All right. So my next reason is that, well, what we have in the novel are sort of outsider characters. Joyce had moved around Dublin. Uh, the family initially had money. The father basically wasted the family's uh, it's somewhat harsh to say wasted, but he, he kind of spent the, the family's wealth. Um, and they kind of descended down from middle class down to lower middle class. Um, and Joyce moved all around Dublin City. So he really knew Dublin. He was Catholic. So he knew the, he went to both uh, school and university in Dublin. So, But his characters are somewhat outsider characters. Like Leopold Bloom is a secular Jewish advertising cam- canvasser, which means that he can move around the city. But he doesn't quite fit into the Catholic uh, nationalist culture. And he is subjected to uh, minor but significant anti-Semitic uh, commentary at various points. Um, and then in one famous episode, he confronts a nationalist who uh, subjects him to um, abuse an abusive tirade. But then he stands up to the nationalist and says, that's not what life is about, um, you know, force and hatred. And they said, they say to him, what, what is it? He says, it's no use, force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And they, then they say to him, what, well, what is it? And he says, well, it's love, the opposite of hatred. And that, that sense of Joyce figuring out Bloom as a way to be a, 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 a force of conscience, a force for compassion and for toleration, as the Irish nationalist movement was gaining steam and was creating these outsider characters. That's part of the power of the novel. So just quickly, let me review the three reasons. So first it's modern. So it's got that fantastic modernist energy. It's very funny. And then it's got this sense of the outsider is somebody we should be listening to. Okay. Let me move on to the next four. Okay. So, um, Dublin had not, in Joyce's view, been fairly represented in literature. So in the 19th century, we have, again, the famous French writers. Balzac makes Paris in the 1830s, a great subject of literature. Uh, Victor Hugo follows him. London is a great subject for the English writers, particularly Dublin. Uh, sorry, particularly London. So Joyce is, is bringing one Dublin into uh, world literature. He only ever writes about Dublin. Now, he writes about other cultures through Dublin. I mean, obviously, Bloom is bringing a Jewish sensibility into Dublin. Um, the next reason is one of the most powerful. This is the stream of consciousness. Uh, the term is usually traced back to the great American psychologist, William James. And what we get is the direct impact of the thoughts of the characters bubbling up like a stream, multiple levels, memory, associative thinking, future thinking, sadness, emotional regret, all kind of bubbling and flowing in different um, in different levels, but all being rendered directly on the page without the mediating editing of the author saying, instead of him saying Leopold Bloom thought to himself, he just starts giving you the thoughts and then you just kind of go, that's that modernist new energy. You've just got to go with that direct access. And this is very revolutionary because directly presenting somebody's thinking will break artistic taboos because certain language certain thoughts about sexuality or politics or certain insulting language or vulgar language, those will be popping into people's minds. Um, and so Joyce is rendering that in a very honest, candid way. It, Patrick, it just occurs to me that, um, do you think that this he would have gotten this idea from people's experiments with automatic writing? Because I think that was going on about this time too. Yeah, the main precursor is a French, is a, is a French writer called... Um, Edouard Dujardin. He wrote a little book called uh, Les Laurels sont coupés, the, the Laurels are cut, in which he had a character in a cafe and he just did it in a sort of a minor way where he had the character's thoughts just kind of popping without mediation from the author. And that Joyce kind of took that stream of consciousness. Um, I mean, literary critics sometimes trace a lot of previous possible precursors 
But the Dujardin novel is, is, is very significant. Taking that hopping of thought, and then Joyce makes it a major artistic statement in this, in this massive uh, canvas of a Dublin day. Okay. All right, so let me give you a little bit of literary history, the next reason. So oh, I, was just, I was just, well, I don't ahead. know. You can go ahead to literary history if you want to, but but I also oh. wanted to bring up, you know, that, that, that I, can, I can imagine Joyce's method for some of this would have been just listening to other people's conversations because in, in the book, there are several instances where one character thinks or says of another, you know, I'd love to, you know, publish a book. I think that's like one of the first characters, Heath or whatever his name is, Haynes, um, Haynes. says of Steve, uh, Le Le no, Stephen Dedalus. Um, and then um, even Molly Bloom wants to like write down what what Leopold Bloom says, and, and he wants to write down what she says. So, I mean, I, it's so interesting. There's this the layers of self-consciousness about how one constructs um, the literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, Joyce had that famous little notebook. He was always jotting down little thoughts as he was uh, writing the writing uh, the drafts of the novel. Um, I do want to just place Joyce um, as not just an isolated genius. So the concept of anxiety and influence, I think, is very helpful to understand literary history. So it's another Bloom, actually, a real a real uh, professor and critic, uh, Harold Bloom, taught for many years at Yale, and so. Um, he argues that literary history progresses because there's a struggle to integrate and surpass uh, precursor writers. So the first one, and let's just gonna cover these writers very quickly. And again, there are more writers we could bring in, but the first one is Homer. So Homer is the foundational genius, I would say, uh, writing epic poetry at the beginning of Western literature in the Iliad and particularly the Odyssey. So Joyce is, see is seeking parallels in his ordinary Dublin day with characters out of the Odyssey. So this, so Stephen, the poet, is sort of like Odysseus's son Telemachus. Bloom is Odysseus uh, with the Latinate name uh, Ulysses. Um, and then Molly is similar and parallel in some respect with uh, Penelope. Except that unlike Penelope, who never has any affairs, Molly does have affairs. So he kind of reverses and plays with the expectations of Homer. Shakespeare is a constant pervasive uh, influence through the novel. Um, and Joyce, com Joyce compares Bloom very much to Shakespeare. In, in Joyce's view, the humanity, the wit, the compassion of Shakespeare, he's trying to inflect through Bloom's character. And then Dublin's first major genius in the 18th century was Jonathan Swift. Um, he wasn't happy that he ended up in Dublin. He was the dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And he wrote the great Gulliver's Travels. And that kind of grisly, realistic, satirical, humorous, innovative imagination Joyce is integrating in his uh, novel. So in Gulliver's Travels, when there's a fire in the palace in Lilliput, Gulliver puts it out by urinating on the palace. And that kind of gross, but kind of funny uh, detail, Joyce, um, Joyce has that kind of gross kind of explicit bodily humor in his own uh, writing. Um, and so before Joyce, uh, Dublin was Swift and Swift was Dublin. So Joyce surplants uh, Swift. So when you go to Dublin today, you'll see statues of Joyce, you'll see posters, you'll see people celebrating Joyce in all kinds of ways. And then the great Italian poet, Dante. Uh, Joyce was like Dante. Joyce studied French and Italian in university. And so he spoke Italian. When the family was at home, they didn't speak English. They spoke Italian around the dinner table. Um, and so Dante's sense of grievance, uh, his sense of putting his enemies into infernos, um, in the circles of inferno, Joyce is picking on the real people, neighbors, friends, fellow writers, who he felt snubbed him. He puts them in very satirical places in uh, in Ulysses. You can, always say, you can always say that it's kind of like a Dublin inferno a little bit, a comic, a comic Dublin Inferno, though I think the Inferno has its comic moments. And then the last writer I mentioned here, George Moore, uh, is probably the most important, um, was very famous in his day. So he's an Irish writer who went to Paris in the 1870s. He studied to be an artist, but, but couldn't quite make it as a visual artist. And then he absorbed all that great French tradition, the tradition of Balzac and Flaubert and Zola. He studied under Zola almost as a disciple. And then he came in the 1880s, started writing novels that broke through 
um, some of the taboos of Victorian um, publishing. So he's a kind of a father figure for Joyce. So Joyce going to Paris, Joyce breaking the taboos, Joyce publishing a, a very uh, innovative uh, work. All of that follows in the tradition of George Moore. So sorry for all of that uh, literary history, but I just want to make the point that James Joyce is, is not a solitary genius just articulating a new vision. He is in conversation with many, many different writers. Go ahead, Lynette. Any other writers that come to mind? No, just, just keep on going. Keep on. Oh, well, I mean, I could I could talk about other writers. I guess the first one that comes to mind is Oscar Wilde, um, who, who um, really, I mean, is maybe a just of the previous generation to Joyce. I don't I don't remember all the dates and everything like that, but Lovely. he has to have been an influence, or if not an influence, certainly a figure. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and uh, Joyce uh, would have been influenced by the kind of the wit, the the uh, the paradoxes of Wilde, um, and so yeah, he would have been that generation that Joyce challenging. Uh, Wilde would have triumphed in in London in in as Joyce was going through his teenage years. So, and, and, and uh, Wilde died in Paris and was buried in Paris. He died in Paris in 1900. So uh, yeah, Joyce would have been familiar with Wilde. That's a great connection. And we could probably populate a whole, a whole larger range of writers, but I just want to touch on some of the most significant. So again, just quickly hitting these reasons again really quickly before we move on. So Dublin becomes a subject of uh, literature. It's now a UNESCO World um, Heritage Literature City. Uh, the stream of consciousness is the central experience, I think, of reading this novel. And then Joyce is in all kinds of playful um, conversations with earlier writers, integrating them, surpassing them, playing around with some of the conventions of their own um, reputation, etc. Okay, so the next three reasons. Okay, this is where the fun really begins. So um, sheer linguistic experimentation and play. So uh, Shakespeare was described by Coleridge is a lord of language. Joyce is also a lord of language. So language is something that you, he has an intense engagement. And he sees how consciousness and language are fused. And as you really look into language, you can express the prism of consciousness and all of its streaming openness. And I would sometimes argue, and I might make the argument myself that language perhaps might be the hero of the book because language, if it is fused with consciousness, is showing us just the strange, everyday, amazing gift we all have, which is the, the stream of consciousness and the, the language that's popping in, uh, in multiple planes through our minds at every, through every conscious moment, which we sometimes take for granted. That's part of the comedy, I think, of Joyce. You know? um, so, uh, Lynette, you're, you're a poet. So does that, were you by the linguistic... It's kind of playful. Oh, oh, it's it, it's playful, but also also very um, very apt, very sharp. You know, I I, I was I was paging through the book. I was looking for um, the oxen of the sun chapter, but of course I don't have it marked here. So instead, I'll um, just quote from. This is when Leopold Bloom is introduced in the Calypso chapter, um, and 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 he's he's feeding the cat. And again, you know, it's it's so delightful, you know. Um, uh, Mr. Bloom watched her curiously, kindly, the lithe black form, clean to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. Wow, the cat cried. They call them stupid. They under understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower? No, she can jump me. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, so, so um, th that's probably not typical, Joyce, but that, you know, it, it is beautifully rendered um, just in terms of the beauty of the cat and how Leopold Bloom sees her. And we, saw, we see a lot about his um, philosophy and attitude towards living things in that little section. Yeah, it's one of the great, it's one of my little favorite uh, vignettes in the novel. It's fantastic. I love the way he gets the voice of the stream of consciousness, perhaps, of the cat. <laughs> Just one word. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, um, 
and the cat has a different meow than Bloom does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so definitely the cat. Yeah, it is the voice of the cat. Okay, reason eight. So mythic method. So this is what T.S. Eliot particularly noticed. So Eliot was was very impressed by the fact that by creating parallels to Homer's Odyssey, you could contain in a uh, a mythic structure the chaos of the modern period. Right. So remember with the with Nietzsche's argument that God is dead and the, the rise of all of these new ideologies and speculations and new psychology, there is a sense in which, well, where are we going? And, and uh, Joyce anticipates kind of what Carl Jung would argue, that we then have a sense of when we start to question the larger traditional forms of meaning, we have to reinvent meaning. And to reinvent meaning, we have to sort of look at mythic archetypes. And so Joyce is placing the archetypes of the hero uh, against the modern, chaotic, urban, everyday streetscape. And he's kind of clashing them together in ways that uh, reinvent um, a sense of how we can bring order out of chaos in the modern period. Um, again, Eliot applied that in his own way in his great poem, um, The Wasteland. So this takes me to the next reason, which is the mock heroic. So partly what Joyce is doing is he's taking heroic archetypes and he's putting them in a, the ordinary man, in an ordinary street. And so he's, it's kind of what's known as a mock heroic element. So in the, the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus blinds the Cyclops with a stake. When uh, Bloom confronts the nationalist, the citizen, in the Cyclops chapter, he has a little cigar, just a little stub of cigar. And so that kind of contrast of, well, instead of a great big stake, he's got this little, little stubby cigar. It's kind of playing with um, uh, mocking the heroic. And so Joyce is saying we want, we want not to have such a violent, aggressive set of archetypes. We should have a sense of humor about the archetypes. And this, the term metempsychosis um, is a fancy word for reincarnation. So the, the conceit of the book is that Bloom is a reborn or reincarnated Odysseus. Remember, Odysseus, when he confronted the Cyclops, says, said, I'm nobody, I'm no man. So Bloom is like a nobody, a, a, an unimportant, ordinary, everyday person. But Joyce's point is that there is no ordinary person. The epiphany is of the ordinary. The ordinary is this amazing gift of language consciousness, um, you know, this quality. Right. So the what, what do you make of that Homeric? Well, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking also, it's interesting as a reader, I, I don't know how current editions publish it nowadays, but the edition I've, I've got, um, which is kind of old, uh, doesn't actually have the chapter titles as the, you know, um, what did I just say? Calypso, for example. Telemachus is is the first chapter um, with Stephen Dedalus. Um, and so, and, and then Molly Bloom is the Penelope chapter. And so, I, I don't know um, if you've seen recent editions. Do we, or, or, or do people have to like look online or something? Because I think it's a lot easier to understand sort of the mythic shape and then um, that, that, that play against the myth. Um, if you've got those chapter titles in front of you, but I think it's easy to forget those parallels if you don't have the chapter titles in front of you. Um, yeah. Have you seen any recent editions? Well, the, the usual, the usual um, process now is to publish it without the the parallel. You got to fish. You got to go fishing for them, unfortunately. Okay. But okay. It's, part of, it's part of the modernist strangeness, I suppose. Uh, okay. Okay. But, Let's, we're, we're nearly through our 12 reasons, and then we'll kind of pause. Um, for reason 10, these are, I think are probably the, the three most important reasons, I think, I, I, I would argue. So probably reason 10, so Leopold Bloom is a vessel for these uh, enormously important values. So uh, he's not aggressive, he's not angry, he's not cruel, he's, he's very humane, so he personifies a a deep sense of humanity. He has a sense of uh, humor, a sense of uh, enjoyment. He's amiable. He has a constant sense of curiosity. Uh, he's a deeply compassionate figure. So he meets um, a woman, Mrs. Breen, in the street in one episode, and she tells him about a woman who's been trying to give birth for three days in the maternity hospital. 
and he's very compassionate, very concerned. He thinks, oh, it must be awful. And so that sense of compassion is crucial to his uh, the power of his character. And then he's very tolerant. He, he, he's, he doesn't believe in political agitation and rhetoric and kind of hateful speech. He's, he wants to argue for the opposite, as he says, to hatred. And that's part of the real, I would say that's one of the main reason, if reasons you should really get engaged with this book, because these values are even more relevant to us today. Um, and then reason 11 is Mali. So Mali is um, famously through 19th century literature, uh, women who have affairs, whether it's Madame Bovary or uh, Bertha Rochester and Jane Eyre, or they're unchaste in some way, they, they get punished horribly or Anna Karenina ends up under a train. And, but Mali, she has an affair and she just, she ends the book with her own just river of thoughts and sort of life energy and, uh, it's very candid. Her voice is liberated, um, and it's, it's very honest. I mean, she's talking about the body. She's talking about sexuality in a very honest uh, way, and that's part of, of the uh, amazing kind of depth of perception into the human spirit that he's um, offering. And then reason twelve uh, is the famous end of the novel. So it ends with all of these yeses. And so it is, um, Joyce argued for the eternal affirmation of the spirit in man. He said, that's what literature does. And so it concludes with this famous life affirming quote. Let me just read it. So she's remem Molly's remembering back to when she first was passionately involved with Leopold uh, when they were young. And she said, she says, um, yes, I, to say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him. Yes. And drew him down to me so he could feel my breast. So perfume. Yes. And his heart was going like man. And yes, I said, yes, I will. Yes. And that final yes is this capitalized affirmation. Um, and I think this leads on to why today is the novel still relevant. Um, for the time, the times are very constrained, particularly about the body, sexuality, candid speech. And so Joyce broke through a lot of those artistic taboos. Um, it took him about nine years to get his first book of stories, Dubliners, pu published because he tried to include words like bloody and the publishers wouldn't, wouldn't uh, publish it. So he really went to, he went, really went to town with Ulysses because there is some uh, language that was considered obscene. Today it would seem very normal, very uh, ordinary language choices. And that's a very small portion of the book. But Joyce wanted to be candid and he wanted to exercise artistic freedom. And I think that's why he was enormously influential on American writers who were coming from an incredibly puritanical and constrained literary environment um, and flocking to uh, Paris at the time. Yeah, um, I just want to go back a little bit um, to Molly and, and her yeah. perspective. So so um, it's clear at the end of the book that that bloom her husband he, bloom is the one that she loves she's having sex with somebody else because she's not having sex with him but <laughs> you know but she, she she likes that excitement of being lusted after and all of that and so so she's finding excitement in that but the person that she really feels soulfully bonded to and enjoys the company of et cetera et cetera um is is leopold bloom so it, it's that is also i think a really interesting perspective because with this end um uh joyce is able to explore all kinds of things about women's sexuality um there, i think there are even a couple of places where she 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 says oh you know i'd like to switch places you know and see you know see what it's like to be a man and feel that thing swelling up you know and <laughs> all you know so she's 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 really um um coming out with just like a number of perspectives um there's a certain multiplicity i think about molly um that is also very very interesting so we're going to start moving into questions uh in a few more we, i guess patrick you have a couple more slides and then i just want to remind you that you can put uh, questions in the q and a and we'll get to that very very soon okay, great thank you for that so what were, what did his fellow irish writers um think of joyce so his older contemporary was the great irish poet uh, William Butler Yeats, who did win the Nobel Prize in 1923. Joyce uh, was never awarded the prize. Um, so in the first letter, 
uh, referring to Joyce, he calls him a man of genius in July 1915. And then in the next letter, he says, I think Mr. Joyce has the most beautiful gift. He is the most remarkable new talent in Ireland today. So, so Yeats was very generous in um, his support of Joyce. And he did write to get Joyce a grant from the Royal Literary Fund. And they gave him, I believe, 75 pounds a year after, after Yeats' intervention. And then it, as episodes of Ulysses were published in some English literary uh, journals, Yeats wrote in a letter, he said, it is an entirely new thing, what the rambling mind thinks and imagines from moment to moment. He has certainly surpassed in intensity any novelist of our time. And then writing to, right after the novel appeared, he fantastic, because he is a great poet, fantastic image, he said, uh, Joyce had a cruel, playful mind like a great soft tiger cat. And there is one further letter, uh, 1923, Joyce was going to visit um, Yates in uh, when he was over in um, uh, in London, I believe, and uh, Yates said he would have to pretend that he had finished the novel because he couldn't finish it. So Yates is one of the very first people who, uh, frankly, states that they couldn't finish the novel. It is it is a uh, it is a brilliant novel, but it is very demanding. It is difficult, famously difficult, to get through the whole thing without being part of a reading group or taking a class, etc. Okay. Um, okay, so my view, so I have to write this bombastic long sentence because why not? So my view, how would I sum up the novel? I said it's an uneven but brilliant book and the work of a supreme literary demolition engineer with his own type of Napoleonic complex operating in a post-Nietzschean world with Swiftian realism, Freudian candor and heaps of comic munitions exploding not only the Victorian novel but many pieties of Irish identity. Um, P.S. Eliot, in conversation with Virginia Woolf, said um, Joyce had had destroyed the 19th century, blown it up. And he meant that in a positive way. This is that modern period. And I'm saying he's Napoleonic in the sense that he inherits again from the French writers. Remember, he studied French and, and Italian languages and literature in university. He, he had inherits that Napoleonic sense of the artist's purpose is just impose a vision on the world. And he, it's successful. I mean, everywhere where people respect literature, Joyce is studied and celebrated. And again, he's post Nietzschean because Joyce writes in in uh, in the uh, in Ulysses that he's writing over the void of incertitude. So he no longer is a Catholic believer, um, but he's not quite sure what where that leads. You. So he's he's presenting an artistic structure where our consciousness is in this mysterious experience of the universe um, and that's that modern turbulent uprooted alienated quality uh, all right and so then your view if you have a view you want to share in the q a um, or lynette what would you say if you had to we, we do have some questions we do have some questions so i think we are going to get people's viewpoints so it's just great. go ahead um, I think you maybe yeah. There we go. I knew there was one more well, slide. What, what's Joyce's view? So Joyce's relative is his aunt Josephine. Um, she was given a copy of the novel, and he asked, uh, he asked, you know, well, what did she think of it? And uh, it was an embarrassed silence. And uh, she said, um, she she she'd given it away. You know, she didn't wouldn't keep it in the house. She didn't think it was fit to be read. Um, and then he said famously that. If Ulysses isn't fit to be read, then life isn't fit to be lived. All right, so uh, yeah. I'm happy to hear questions. Go ahead. We have questions. We have questions. So uh, one question, do either of you feel that Alan Moore also tried to take this anxiety of influences construct forward in his book, Jerusalem? And I am afraid I don't know that book. Um, this is the same Alan Moore of The Watchmen, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes. Are you familiar with that book, Patrick? I know the book is a monstrosity of amazing, it's a monumental work. So yes, the great Alan Moore, the great English uh, writer. So yes, I would say he did. Um, I would have to, uh, I, I would have to kind of look more closely at the novel, but yeah, it's the same kind of magnum opus, monumental milestone. Extraordinary tour de force. Yeah, 
and he's the he's the league of extraordinary gentlemen and all that too, those kinds of things yeah that's right that's right i yeah. knew that there was another one that i couldn't remember okay and he, and he is influenced, he's influenced by joyce because joyce is this is an interesting question um um joyce's daughter lucia uh suffered from schizophrenia and the hospital that she was moved to in england was close to where alan moore uh, lived uh, and so he knew there was a Joycean element. So uh, yeah. let me stop there because I'm I'm stretching my <laughs> off the top of my head knowledge of Alan Moore. Great stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so here's another question: uh, What later authors were influenced by Joyce's Ulysses, and how does his influence appear in their work? Well, he's very influenced. Well, there's multiple answers to that. So let me just talk about the Irish writers. So the great Irish. Um, a woman novelist, uh, she's still alive, a uh, great, great figure, uh, Edna O'Brien. Yes. When she wrote as a young woman, the Country Girls trilogy, uh, she references in those books that she's reading Joyce's Dubliners. And she's she has written her own short biography of Joyce, I think, for the Penguin Lives edition. And some of her characters, like Baba in the Country Girls, is kind of like Molly Bloom. If, she, if Molly Bloom got out of Seven Eccles Street and moved to London and got married and was more moving around outside of Ireland uh, in terms of wit and kind of uh, kind of an earthy common sense and a sort of an irreverent spirit. Um, the contemporary Irish author, uh, Colin McCann, is very Joycean in, in his own kind of variations on stream of consciousness. Uh, American authors, there's many, many, many American authors. So Hemingway is very influenced by Dubliner, Sherwood Anderson, Escott Fitzgerald was, he, he knocked on Joyce, Joyce's apartment and wanted to jump off the balcony if that was what Joyce wanted. And Joyce uh, commented to Nora, what is, what is the problem with this uh, somewhat insane American author? So again, the American authors, I think, saw the taboo breaking, the artistic freedom, the sheer ambition and the dedication to literary art as deeply inspirational. Okay. Here's another question. When was Ulysses finally published uncensored in Ireland? Oh, very good question. So again, the censorship story is another whole saga. So um, Bennett Cerf in America uh, took a case to the, uh, the, the uh, District Court of Appeals, uh, and that came to the court in 1933. And then the judge, John Woolsey, uh, wrote a very famous um assessment, uh, judgment, uh, and, and saying that it wasn't um, obscene. He said it was dull and brilliant, <laughs> depending on which page you were reading. And he said it's, it's, it wasn't pornographic, it wasn't obscene, it was a, a fantastic attempt to render the kaleidoscope of uh, consciousness by a very serious literary artist. And so that, that allowed Bennett Cerf to publish it in 1934 in um, uh, the Random House edition, which is usually the most popular edition people still uh, refer to and then British Isles it was released from public released from um, being banned as obscene in 1936 so after that time before that time you had to smuggle it in but after that time it was more um, available now there was a, there was censorship though in Ireland because of the again there was a lot of Aunt Josephines who didn't think it was fit to be read <laughs> so there's there is that, you know, it might be available, but who wants to be seen reading it? Uh, uh, in Ireland, the turning point, I would say, is 1954, when there's first Irish writers, Patrick Kavanagh, Flann O'Brien. Uh, they held the first kind of Bloomsday celebration where they toured around uh, horse, and, horse and wagon, they toured around Dublin uh, to celebrate the novel. And then after 1959, there's the famous Elman biography. And in the 60s, there was a real boom in scholarship and real celebration of, um, of Joyce. And it's just continued at pace. I mean, people will be celebrating the 100th anniversary all around uh, the world today. Yeah. And we have a few more questions. Um, uh, what did critics say? Well, you've already said something about critics about uh, um, talking about Ulysses, but, but that was sort of the critical reception. But maybe I think this is a question about like book reviewers. Uh, what did they say about Ulysses and who were his critics well basically the basic view was this is a work of genius but it's gone too far that was the initial response that 
he's he's trying to be too innovative he's too candid there's too much you know he's he's accelerated literature uh 50 years ahead of time when he, he's he's this is why the, the boom is right in the 60s with with joyce and studies i mean the culture is not ready for joyce which is way ahead of its time and that was kind of the, the consensus of the critics um that there's just too much you know it's too much happening it's too innovative too too uh too many levels too many layers it just broke up the conceptual constrictions on what a novel should be doing and on so many different uh, levels and facets and planes simultaneously that it just there was again there's that sense of shock there was a sense that this is uh, this is a staggering novel in terms of its innovation but just too much you know which still is sometimes people's reaction to it but if you go slowly it's it's worth it so so we have several more questions but i know that there's sort of a time limit on this um can you get a sense? How much longer do you want to go, Patrick? Oh, just a few more minutes is fine on that. A few more minutes? Okay, okay. So um, one is, do you believe Joyce's modernist way of thinking is still with us in the Irish colleges around the world? And uh, adding- well, we do teach uh, we do teach James Joyce here at the Irish College, which is uh, the educational programs at Celtic Junction. So. Um, I know in April we'll be teaching a class, at least one class on, on the novel. So um, his modernist way has kind of pervaded the culture. I mean, it's it's what happens to tremendously innovative uh, writers is their innovations are just absorbed into the bloodstream. And then it doesn't seem to be that, uh, that incredible anymore. But Joyce, though, I think is still has the capacity to stagger and astonish, you know, because it is incredibly innovative. Okay. And then uh, another listener asks, um, just finished the Paris bookseller, a book about Sylvia Beach and Shakespeare and company. Joyce is not presented in a favorable light in the process of the publication of Ulysses. Do you believe the author Mayer is accurate? Yes. Yes. So Joyce, uh, I think it's fair to say, took advantage of the awestruck um, attitude of Sylvia Beach um, a, nearly a third of the novel was written in galley proofs and revisions of galley proofs, uh, page proofs and galley proofs. So um, he massively expanded, revised. He nearly drove the poor printer uh, um, insane. And, and Sylvia Beach was, it, it was being revised two days before the publication deadline, which was his birthday. Every second was his birthday. And she delivered uh, two copies. Uh, she was at the, uh, I think it was the Gare de Lyon or Gare de Nord, the railway station in Paris, and the printer just brought in the two copies. They were done. They were on a blue cover with the white lettering that it's the, the color of the Greek uh, nation. And she put one in. She brought one in a taxi ten minutes later to Joyce's apartment, presented it to him on his birthday, and then put one in the window of Shakespeare and Company. And the rest is literary history. <laughs> 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 Joyce all over the world, um, but she was she was way too lenient. You know, she wasn't uh, she wasn't uh, you know she wasn't allowing she wasn't he wasn't being met with a uh, uh, a, a resistant editor, which many uh, many commentators, many Irish commentators, Robbie Roddy Doyle, famously said, "It's a very good book if he had an editor." <laughs> but, uh, he said that now, not me. But there you go. So, so there's just one more question, and this is a very general kind of speculative question. Um, how did Joyce have such great confidence? Uh, I think it's the Napoleonic com- complex. So Bal- Balzac, the great French writer from the 1830s, remember Napoleon had died in, in um, St. Helena in 1821. Um, Balzac had a bust of Napoleon. He said that um, what Napoleon conquered through military campaigns I will conquer through my literary imagination. And there's that sense of writers could dominate Europe the way Napoleon had dominated Europe. Um, and Balzac is the first one who really exemplifies that. Hugo follows, and then certainly Flaubert, and then Zola is following Balzac. So that big French influence comes in through Irish writing through George Moore, who I mentioned, because he studied in uh, France and went initially to England to break up the Victorian novel. And then moved to be, to uh, Dublin to be part of the Irish literary renaissance. Joyce picks up that Napoleonic um, 
complex, and it's it's an important thing to recognize that French influence in Irish writing in the sense that you can conquer if you stick to your uh, artistic vision, and he did, and he has. The world has the world has reorganized itself to put Joyce at the center of modern literature. Thank you. That is a lovely final statement. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I'm Lynette Rainey-Grandell, and this is Patrick O'Donnell, and that's it.